Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here, and today I've got another interesting knife discussion topic to share with you guys, slash ramble to share with you guys. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the difference between a good knife and a bad knife. This video is directly uh, meant for, or it's, it's uh, intended for new people in the knife community. Um, I know, you know, that I would say most of my viewers, probably my, my subscribers, you guys know, you know, you don't need this information. Um, and, uh, you know, you've, you've got it from one place or another, maybe you even got it from my channel, right? And you have an idea of what a good knife is to you. Um, this is, I, I like catering to new people. I like, I like trying to explain things, um, in a way that I, I think that I feel is beneficial to new people in the knife community. I want this community to continue to grow. Um, I, I want, uh, you know, people to get a positive experience from the knife community. There's negativity everywhere, you know, no matter what it is that you're looking for. If you're on YouTube or you're in forums or you, if you log on to the internet, generally the first thing that you see is something negative, right? Um, I want to do my best to spread positivity. So I'm going to do this video. It kind of seems like something I should have done a long time ago, but it's also kind of a um, dangerous <laughs> topic to explore because, um, like I started to say, everybody has a different idea of exactly where that line is. I'm going to try and actually point to the to the exact line between a good and a bad knife. It's it's very difficult to do. Um, if you ask somebody, you know, well, what you know, somebody says, well, why are you carrying that? That's a that's not a good knife. Well, what's a good knife? Well, th these you know, Benchmade makes good knives. Right, you generally get that type of answer, and usually what you're getting is, in my own opinion, which I'm not going to go into detail about, um, I've had a good experience with this knife based on exactly what I use it for, <laughs> and uh, my opinion of value and blah blah blah, all that. You know, it's all like you know that specific person, and it's impossible to keep my own biases out of a video like this, but. Um, the end goal is to help people transition away from some of this stuff. Sorry, Zell, my buddy Zell gave me that uh, jokingly as a, um, something else, but, um, but, uh, to get, to help people transition away from this stuff and into some better options. Um, another common thing that you guys hear, everybody hears this. We all are guilty of saying it and we've heard it. You get what you pay for. Well, you get what you pay for, right? Yeah, that's true, but it's super not helpful. <laughs> what does that mean? How much money do I have to spend to get to the area that you call good, right? How much does good cost? Turns out that good doesn't always cost that much. In fact, good can be had for uh, sometimes less than some of this stuff costs, you know? Um, so that's not a helpful um, thing. Um, there is definitely a correlation between, you know, depending on how much of a knife that you need, how durable it is, how capable it is, what it's made out of, certainly the more you pay, oftentimes you do get more, right? There's a point of diminishing returns, but that's not what we're talking about here today. We're not talking about, would you spend a thousand dollars on a knife? Would you spend $200 on a knife? I'm not talking about that. I always try to tell people if that's what you're going to, if if you feel like compelled to leave that comment, nope, not talking about that. It's not, not, not relevant. Um, but uh, I am going to try and point some of this stuff out. Um, thanks so much to my generous patrons who are supporting me during this time. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, get your hands on those stickers and some other exclusive benefits, there is, of course, a link down in the description. Uh, you can check that out. And if you decide to support me, it would absolutely mean the world to me. All right, so um, many people have heard the term Mall Ninja, right? Everybody, especially people who have been involved in the knife community for a long time. Mall Ninja, what does that mean? Well, um, we all started somewhere, guys, and um, I, you know, if you tell me that you there wasn't a point in your life, maybe when you were younger, that this wasn't attractive to you, I would say you're probably lying. You know, as a kid, seeing something like this, um, I would be like, wow, cool, it's black, it's got the holes in it, look at that wicked blade shape and scorpions and skulls and stuff all over it. Yeah, 100%. You go back and you tell, you know, 12-year-old me, pick that up for $14.99 right now, I'd be like, heck yeah. You know, hand it over. Here's the money, right? It's cool. Now, if you weren't, you know, let's say you're an adult and you, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you're into. That's perfectly okay. Maybe you're into that stuff and you're fully aware of what else is available um, for, you know, similar money or perhaps spending a little bit more money, you could get a, a higher quality item, right? 
um, that's perfectly okay. If you're content to stick with stuff like this because it is appealing to you for one reason or another, I'm not going to try and change your mind. Everybody should enjoy what they like to enjoy. This is still a knife, right? And people who are, you know, people who love the knife community, maybe they do like that. You know, maybe they're into that and a combination of some other stuff, you know, not here to judge. Um, but I am going to, like I said, I'm going to describe uh, between these things. Mall Ninja refers to um, a person who um, is very much into, I don't know, you know, really into the, the hyper-tactical looking stuff mixed with the fantasy stuff. Um, and the uh, the appeal to this stuff is that it looks interesting. It's, it's very busy, right? People are attracted to things with dragons on them, scorpions, skulls, right? I mean, there's a common theme here. Skulls, by the way, yes, this is a Z Hunter sent to me by Nick Shabazz himself. Um, skulls, dragons, skulls, and a scorpion, right? It's all, it has to do with the menacing stuff, right? And a lot of times people who are interested in knives kind of like that, that stuff, right? The menacing. And here's the funny thing, the ironic thing, is that we associate uh, a, a certain, you know, cheapness with stuff like that. But... If you get high enough into the knife world, the really ultra high-end art knives that are made out of premium materials and are, you know, they, they are actually functional. They are meant to, you know, designed to be used. Whether or not you actually use some of those things is up to you. But some of that stuff actually does have skulls and dragons and stuff. Take Hinders, for example, uh, collaborating with Steel, Fra Steel Flame. Um, have you ever seen a Hinder X-M18 with the Steel Flame pocket clips? Dragons. Check. Skulls, check. Crusader crosses, check. It's all there. So the appeal is whether you consider yourself somebody who has evolved into the, the higher, you know, the upper tiers. Have you, if you've, you know, <laughs> if you've climbed the golden staircase to the upper tier of the knife community, right? A lot of us still end up enjoying the same things. And I think that they, you know, they figured it out. Is that like, you know, we are, our perspective on what is quality changes, but what we are drawn to, the inner child in us, still remains, right? And so, yeah, you know, um, just because it's got skulls and dragons and stuff on it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. But, um, if, you know, gas station knife, mall ninja, tactical, all of those words are associated with cheap knives that are slapped together, usually made in China uh, or, or Pakistan or wherever. Um, and they're bright and they're colorful and they have the stuff on them. It's meant to draw you in. Look at this. Look how interesting and crazy this is, right? I appeal to you. I, I help you display your personality on an item that you are also interested in, right? And uh, there's a, there, yeah, I mean, like, kn knife people often start out you know, being interested in stuff like that. The fact that it is a blade suggests that it can be used for, uh, you know, what people use knives for stupid things but you know it's it's also something you can cut with it's something you can carry on your person right and so it's cool and it and it's you know or it looks cool and it, it can be had for not very much money right um and uh i think a lot of people you know they see knives like that and then they go you know and they they look at walmart and there's some knives that are a little more expensive maybe they they you know when i was younger i thought okay so these are kind of toys but obviously like the stuff that looks military that's the serious stuff right that Gerber Fast at Walmart at 65 bucks looks very military, what I assume military looks like. So that must be the better stuff. That must be the really cool stuff. It's black, right? That's actually the term associated with tactical is, again, it's meant to appeal to the, the part of, you know, the people who are interested in knives and also people who, um, you know, uh, are really into military stuff, right? And the confusing thing is, is that there are knives that are actually super high quality that are made for, you know, soldiers or military police, you know, whoever, um, that, that do look like that, right? Um, what it's made out of, where it's made, how it's made, um, how, you know, all those little things will determine exactly how much it costs. Uh, for, for new people, something like this, this is basically metal with metal that takes the form of a knife, and it can be sharp. All steel is not created equal. In fact, quite very much not the case. Uh, not all steel is created equal. Uh, how long a steel holds an edge, what shape it takes, how efficiently it cuts, what it's designed to do. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the nicer knives, the higher quality knives, will all of that will be paid attention to. This is a handle that you can hold on to, and it is a blade that will cut, right? 
this, I can push this through a box and open a box with it, right? And listen, if you don't need anything more complicated than this, maybe it works just fine, you know? Maybe it works just fine for you. That's all you need in a knife and it brings you joy. And in that case, do, do, do those people really need to graduate into something better? No, not really, you know? But if, if, you, if you find yourself not wanting to spend more than 10, 20 bucks on a knife, truthfully, another knife that I just personally don't like, but a lot of people do like, um, is the Opino. And uh, to those of you, you know, who, who might be into the more flashy stuff, you look at this and go, oh my God, that's so boring. You know, but the idea here is, again, that the handle is designed out of something that is durable and inexpensive. Uh, it has a very simple locking mechanism. The spring, it doesn't explode out of the handle and take this wicked form, right? But, um, you know, if you're just cutting open boxes um, or, or doing simple tasks, then the open L actually works just fine. The blade locks securely with that little ring lock there. You can see it just sort of turns and locks. The blade is fully flat ground on purpose because it, uh, it, it will pass through material efficiently without anything getting hung up. This, you know, pushing it, it's, it's thicker. It has this recurve right here. This flat extends, you know, the, through the majority of the length and height of the blade. So this comes down to an edge that is not thin at all, which means you have to press harder. It can get hung up, you know, if you're making a diagonal cut, cut because of uh, where this recurve ends and this new grind begins, right? Um, it's got this massive sort of, I guess, trailing point blade, which, I mean, Truthfully, just getting into a box and cutting with it, it this is going to be a much more efficient tool. It's also going to be a lot easier to carry despite not having a pocket clip. This in your pocket? Are you serious? It's just going to hook onto stuff. And it's just, it's this thing that, yeah, it might, you know, you might think that's visually appealing, right? Maybe substantial. I mean, truthfully, that is more visually appealing than, <laughs> than the open L, but I could never carry this because it's just not an efficient tool. But it's spring, it springs out, right? It's just not an efficient tool. It's uh, not going to be comfortable to hang on to for a long period of time if you're making continuous cuts. The blade is not going to pass through material readily. Uh, it's certainly not going to stay sharp very long. And that's not to say that the Open L will stay sharp forever. But the Open L is made in a way that emphasizes, you know, uh, uh, utility and convenience, right? Get it out, cut with it, get the job done, and move on. That's what that is. That's an inexpensive example of that. Um, the, uh, a lot of times higher end knives will not hide what it is that they are made out of a, a consistency that you see with, um, inexpensive knives is, um, they're going to try and fool you on, you know, number one, they're going to try to appeal to you with names. Like in this case, this is Z hunter, Z hunter, right? Zombie hunter. That's cool, right? The idea of having to survive a zombie apocalypse and fight off zombies, right? You're going to need, you're going to need a dependable tool for that, right? Obviously, the implication is, is that you're in an apocalypse scenario and you have to fight for your life, right? So you're going to need a tool that's going to last. Well, Z Hunter's got you covered, right? Seems like they're made specifically for that. Oh, God. Um, well, in, in reality, it's just, it's not the case. It's got the black blade. Um, it says custom design. That's confusing. Cust I heard custom knives are really good, right? Custom knives? This is a custom design. Not the case. It's just, it's just the dialogue that they're using on the blade. Um, a, a custom knife is one that is, you know, in my definition of that, and, and collectively you'll hear this in the knife community, uh, most people will agree that a custom knife is one that is designed head to toe custom and then created by hand, right? So a custom knife, you know, for, from the U.S. would be like a knife that somebody, you know, gathered up the raw materials and turned them into a knife, every last little aspect, aspect being handmade and usually with high-end materials. And it usually takes a form that is meant to be used and it's meant to be used efficiently. And oftentimes there'll be other embellishments, things on there, blah, blah, blah. But that's what a custom knife is. This is custom design doesn't mean much. <laughs> it really doesn't mean anything. I mean, you, if this is a custom design, then anything, anything is a custom design, right? Uh, made in China, model number ZB137, 440 stainless steel. That also doesn't mean anything. 440 stainless, 440 what? 440A, 440B, 440C. There's different, uh, the, you know, different types of 440. Um, stainless steel just means that it's stainless. It means that it's got above 14% chromium in it and it's going to resist corrosion in a, a general way. Also, the fact that it is black doesn't necessarily mean that much. There, I've got uh, blades that are like this, that it's basically just paint. Um, and then I've got uh, blades that are coated in, what's a, what's a good example that I didn't get out here? Um, let me grab my Benchmade. This is a Benchmade um, 
super freak in CPM M4. CPM M4 is an incredibly high end steel, uh, powder formed uh, for even particle distribution. That way you don't have any weak spots in the blade in terms of the composition. What it was designed to be was a blade that will hold an edge for an incredibly long period of time. So the composition of the steel will determine exactly how it can perform and also how well it was heat treated, which is something that takes place in a knife like this and does not take place in a knife like that. I mean, not nearly as much. Um, CPM is standing for crucible powder metallurgy, I, I believe, or, or uh, crucible powder metal, um, is, uh, uh, th th they're in the United States. Um, and then anyways, the, the M4, the CPM M4, because there's a lot of different CPM steels, um, is designed to be very tough, have incredible edge stability, which means the edge will resist, um, you know, uh, fracturing or chipping. It'll roll, which makes it a little easier to sharpen if it does take, take damage than a knife that, that chips out. Um, and, and then the edge retention or the, the, uh, the edge's ability to remain sharp for an extended period of time, right? Because it is not stainless, because the composition they uh, it requires that that less chromium is in it to, to take this form to get those attributes. Um, it, it's not stainless, so it actually does benefit from a coating in this case, a real coating. And I believe um, it, is Benchmade's coating Cerakote. I know it's not PVD or DLC. I think it's more of a Cerakote, but it is a coating that is actually designed to bond to the surface of the metal uh, in a way that that it, it's very very durable. It's very hard. It's you're not going to scratch through it easily. This is going to come off basically the first time that you use it. Doesn't matter if it's brand new or not, because it's basically paint. It's it's on there because people think black blades look cool, right? And so it, it doesn't. They don't care about what happens to it afterwards. They just want you to like it. It's green. It's got skulls on it, and it's black, and it's serrated, and it says Z Hunter, and it says custom design. That's just all of that is just to pull you in and say, buy this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's not to say that aesthetics don't play a role in higher end knives too. I mean, absolutely. This has a, a lot of elements here that look good, but, uh, function is considered first here. So, uh, the blade takes a shape that is convenient and, uh, um, you know, in terms of cutting, it's, you're, you're going to pass through material easily. Uh, it's going to be strong. It's going to resist, um, chipping. It's going to hold an edge for a very long time. And what it lacks in uh, corrosion resistance is made up for in a durable coating that also resists uh, you know, corrosion. So that's, that would be the different difference there. Also in terms of handle materials, it, you know, this is gr bright green. It has skulls on it, but it is plastic. I mean, like not, not FRN, not, not anything, you know, not fiberglass reinforced nylon or grivery, anything like that. That is a plastic that's actually designed to be durable. That injection mold stuff. Uh, this is just plastic, right? It's not durable in, in any way, shape or form. It's just, it's, it's there to fill the hand, to be bright and colorful, right? And I suppose you, you could argue that it, 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 there's some structural integrity over it. I mean, if the, um, if the other option was basically just wicker, <laughs> but it is not durable. It's just, it's the bare minimum that went into the design for manufacturing. Um, they, the, the idea here with something like this is, it needs to take a cool form, but we need to save every penny on everything else. The manufacturing process, the knife basically needs to deploy and it needs to kind of, in this case, it's not even locking, which is what makes knives like these dangerous. This is a brand new knife. I had to give it some risk to do that, right? So it's not locking efficiently or anything like that because the tolerances weren't, I mean, they didn't take that into consideration that all the, you know, the surfaces between the liner lock and the tang of the blade, they're just good enough to kind of function right? The blade is a blade. It is made out of metal. It is kind of, kind of sharp, I guess, you know, from the factory, it, it, it has a handle, right? It will go in the pocket. It has a pocket clip, what the pocket clip is made out of, how many processes there were to get it from materials to a blade shape to a shelf where you could buy it that they, as, as inexpensive as possible. That's the goal there. Get it to the shelf, make people buy it and make as much money as possible on it. That is the idea with stuff like this. Same thing here, fixed blade. It is a blade, it is made of metal. It's cast from some type of metal. It takes the form of dragons and some shiny, some some blue stuff in there. But no, there's no, I mean, on top of that, I mean, look, I mean, you, you can't hang on to this. It's, what is this? I'm gonna hurt myself using this for anything, right? It sure, I mean, I understand, you know, yeah, it looks cool, but um, that's, uh, it, it's, it's just a thing with a blade. Um, now knives definitely do get more expensive and I've had 
you know, countless videos uh, where I discuss in depth my opinions on where your money's going. And the more money you spend, uh, that, that money goes in a lot of different directions, right? You know, so how much money do you have to spend to get a good knife? Again, it does depend on what it is that you're going to be doing with it. And it also, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to toss your own personal preferences out the window for aesthetics. There are options out there. The knife world is so big now and it caters to so many different types of people that quality can be had in so many different forms. Rest assured, this is never, you know, if you're looking for a tool, a quality tool, you do not have to stick with this just because, you know, people have told you that you have to spend a lot of money to get a good knife. No. In fact, I would argue that a good knife can be had starting at right about $20, which is oftentimes where this stuff sits. $19.95 from Bud K. Right? You guys get that joke. Um, by the way, I mean, like, nothing against Bud K, but if, if that's where you're buying your knives, the Bud K catalog, I mean, that's that's kind of who I'm I'm talking to. Not to say that Bud K, you know, the Bud K magazine doesn't have anything in it that's good, but that's, I mean, I, I remember loving looking through the Bud K magazine. You know, that's where, that's where this all started. Um, but yeah, I mean, the open L for sure. I mean, if you can let go of the whole, you know, your knife needs to look really, really cool thing, then sure, you know, that's that's a great one. Uh, companies like CJRB, uh, Civivi, Best Tech, um, they all make knives between about the $30 mark and the $60 mark. Now, that is a big step up for a lot of people, but oftentimes what you're getting, you know, for example, this is the CVV Praxis, it's about a $50 knife. You are getting a blade that takes a shape that emphasizes utility and cutting performance. It's thin behind the edge, right? Um, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, the tip is one that can function, I mean, it, one that can puncture efficiently, right? It's got jimping up here. It's, it's meant to sort of, um, course, well, it, it, it's meant to be uh, an efficient place to put your thumb in uh, comparison where you would naturally put your index finger or, you know, back here in the standard position, or if you're going to choke up on it, right? Thinking of how you're going to use this, how you're going to be holding it, depending on what you're going to do with the knife, they have considered that and they've made ample room for your hand. They've also made it comfortable to hold, chamfering down edges, right, knocking things down everywhere to make sure that this knife is comfortable for an extended period of time. On top of that, the tolerances are tight, meaning the blade does not wiggle when it locks out. It will always lock out. It doesn't need a spring to deploy because the detent ball or the detent itself, which is this part here, that sucks the blade into the handle, there's enough uh, you know, tension holding it in that as you break it with that flipper tab, natural, you know, the kinetic energy that's built up will naturally throw the blade, which means you don't have to worry about, you don't have to depend on a spring to fire the blade. Um, you can simply use kinetic energy. There's le there are less parts in this design um, and the less, therefore less that you have to worry about. Um, on top of that, you know, generally with, you know, functional designs comes simplicity. Uh, oftentimes you will see a simple, uh, handle shape, um, a simple handle design. In this case, it's G10, which is um, a, it's like a, a compressed uh, layers of fiberglass, you know, that um, are, are able to be molded into different shapes. Very durable, heat and cold resistant, right? They, they can take many different colors, so they can uh, still uh, appeal to people who have, you know, different aesthetic tastes, right? This, the blade is actually a, a steel that um, people use for folding knives, D2, not quite a stainless steel, but uh, one that's known generally uh, to be tough, uh, resist chipping, um, and uh, that will hold an edge for a while, right? So it, it oftentimes will take form in something like this, and, and that, that can be had there, you know? Uh, for a fixed blade, you know, Moraniv or Moranive or Moraniv or however you want to say that. Uh, again, simplicity. This this uh, this blade was meant to be um, very inexpensive but extremely functional. The handle is not made out of anything special, and truthfully, the blade isn't either. Um, but it is stainless. It is robust. This is actually the Moranive robust, um, and it'll fill the hand and will be comfortable to use, you know, for an extended period of time. There's nothing in you know extra there. It's all of it is is going into you know, what is it going to be used for? What what shape does this need to, t to take to make those tasks as convenient and, and quick as possible? And that, that's the idea there. Um, now, you can spend more money. You know, a knife that is actually made in the United States um, is going to cost more money, period. That's Things cost more to make in the United States, right? 
You can spend some more money. You can get, um, you know, a steel that many people consider to be a lot better than uh, like D2 or, or 440C, uh, M390. Uh, that's a composition that um, does not emphasize toughness, right? If we're talking about M4 being a steel that has a lot of toughness and not a lot of corrosion resistance, but it's got really good edge retention, right? M390 has a lot of corrosion resistance, really good edge retention, um, but not a lot of um, toughness. Did I say that right? No, not a lot of toughness, a lot of edge retention, and a lot of corrosion resistance. Um, so if you're going to be working in an environment, you know, where the knife might get wet, right, or maybe you just don't need as much toughness. Maybe you're like, I don't, I'm not beating the crap out of my knife. I just want it to hold an edge for a really long time. Well, then maybe M390 is the way to go. Um, and then, uh, you know, this knife has the axis lock, or actually they call it the able lock from Hogue. It's very easy to manipulate. It doesn't use a spring. Very smooth, running on phosphor bronze washers, and that's all intentional. Everything here is intentional. The idea is ease of manipulation. A quality build, a tight build, a, a firm locking build, but one that, you know, um, emphasizes the ability to pull the knife conveniently from your pocket, hang on to it, deploy it, use it without worrying about whether or not the, the blade is going to disengage. Um, and you can use it continuously because the materials are made to be used continuously. The blade is shaped in a way that's meant to be used continuously. Then you can safely disengage the lock, right? You can pull the blade back down, put it back down, put it back in your pocket and go on about your day. You don't have to fight it getting it in and out of your pants. You imagine this in and out of your pants, you know. I know people who carry stuff like this. There's no way that you can tell me that that's convenient to come in and out of your pants. It's just not. It's, it's not going to be the case. I don't know how you would carry this. <laughs> but this seems silly, but again, I'm really, I, I want, I want people to find this video who are new and curious about, you know, what, what's the big deal about, you know, wh where's the line, you know, between good and bad. Um, knives that make it more confusing. This is a Microtech sigil made out of titanium and brass. And it certainly does in a lot of ways look like a knife that's in the same, you know, vicinity of aesthetics as this. But the, the, the thing here is, is that this is going to appeal to people who find, uh, you, you know, who, um, find joy in, in uh, aesthetics like this, right? It has a lot of unnecessary sort of tactical looking lines. But at the same time, it actually does take a shape that is, uh, good on the hand or that it, it feels natural in the hand. There's jimping in the right place. The hole, while it, you know, it has this kind of cool, aggressive look to it, it actually is a convenient means of deployment. And once again, it is manual. You'll find that there's a correspondence between manual knives and quality knives, um, which means you can use the flipper tab to conveniently deploy it, or you can use the thumb hole to slowly open it, or you can, you know, flick it out, or you can do the reverse flick. This uh, design is one that emphasizes ease of manipulation, even though it does take a form that has kind of this aggressive, almost fantasy tactical look to it. It is substantially more expensive because, again, it's made in the United States. Um, it's made with much more premium materials, right? I mean, not necessarily the brass, but the titanium uh, material that's, you know, designed to be light and strong and forgiving. You know, uh, titanium is certainly more forgiving than steel um, in terms of how springy it is. It's much more likely to, instead of bend, it's much more likely to spring back into its original form, right? Uh, knives like the ZT0777 which take, you know, a really exotic form. Sure, functions there, you know. Uh, it's got uh, premium steel on it. In this case, I think it's Van X35, and it's a composite blade, so it's actually combined with Damascus. Um, now, is that something you have to spend a whole bunch of money on? Are you gaining that much more benefit between this and some of these other things? You know, I mean, no, it appeals to the, the enthusiast part of the knife community that, that wants to spend some extra money for some elements like that because they enjoy them visually, right, you know, or just because it's this high-end thing, because it is expensive, because it is exotic, right? It's interesting, but it also takes a form that is perfectly functional. It's also made out of carbon fiber, which makes the knife substantially, substantially lighter than a knife like this. And this can also be confusing with new people because I, you know, I used to think like this, that the heavier an item was, the, you know, obviously it, it was higher quality. If it was dense and solid and heavy feeling, it must be higher quality. Um, that, that's a really hard thing to get around, you know, as a new for person, because really premium, you know, knives, um, uh, there's actually an emphasis on the item being lightweight so that it is easier to carry. And oftentimes it helps balance out a design that's would be heavier on one end or the other, right? Lightweight materials can help balance their, they help the reduce the overall weight of the item, right? make it a little bit easier to carry, especially if you're carrying a lot of things besides just a knife. Reducing the, the weight of the knife by two, three, four, five, six ounces sometimes can really make a huge difference. So 
um, that, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a factor there. And you know, the, the strength of it too, carbon fiber is very strong. So having a good strength to weight ratio uh, and then having that combined uh, with a utilitarian design and an ergonomic design, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing there. Now, th those things oftentimes do cost more money um, in partially because of demand and partially um, just because of sometimes how difficult they are to machine. Um, you know, plastic, it takes a lot less money to machine plastic into a certain shape than it does titanium and carbon fiber into a certain shape, right? And if the that plastic is being manufactured in China where, uh, you know, it costs substantially less, labor costs are less and manufacturing costs are less, then you've got a recipe for, you know, an item that just doesn't cost very much to make but can take a, an appealing form. Whereas this also takes an appealing form, but it is made out of materials that cost more to machine uh, in an area where labor and manufacturing costs are higher, um, but they are substantially more beneficial as a tool, right? So, you know, that's oftentimes that's where the, the cost comes from. And I'm, I'm sort of transitioning into um, a, another video where I've talked about this specifically, but yeah. That and to continue on here, you know, you've got, like I was going to use the, the hinder, uh, for example, which is a, a knife that doesn't take any uh, form that's, you know, hyper exotic or hyper, you know, tactical. In this case, it does have a black finish, but again, it's, a, it's much of the same thing. You know, all the design elements are all purposeful. Uh, this one is, you know, thick and heavy, but it is made out of titanium, which is, which makes it substantially lighter than uh, the exact same thing if it were made out of steel. Um, but this is designed for some more heavy duty tasks for a folding knife. Um, it's also made in the United States, made out of premium steel, you know, the design, there's more goes into it, right? So yeah, you, I mean, my point is, is that you can spend a lot more money uh, you know, if you want to and get arguably a better design, you know, but it depends on what you're going to use the knife for. We are well over 30 minutes into this video and anybody who's still here, the initial, you know, the intended audience for this, if you're still here and you're wondering, you know, you haven't really defined the exact line between a good and a bad knife. Truthfully, it's going to come down to, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you know, take the initiative on that when you're handling the item. Things you want to check for. Uh, initially is right when you get the knife, uh, a good place to start is blade centering. Is the blade centered? Um, is the knife easy to deploy? Does it deploy efficiently? Is it grindy on the inside? Can I hear clickiness or anything like that? When it locks out, which this is not wanting to do it, is it solid? If you're moving it this way and back, can you feel clicks, right? Does it feel like it's the blade is moving? If you move it back and forth this way. Does it feel like it wiggles, right? Those are signs of poor tolerances. That means when it was put together, it wasn't uh, put together in a way that where it keeps all of those things in place. Why is that important? Well, because if you're feeling wiggle right here up and down, it means that that lock is actually moving on the, the, the surface of the tang. And that's not good because it means that the blade could potentially disengage while you're using it. And then you have something that will bite you, right? You also want to look at the edge. Uh, unevenness in the edge is an indicator um, that they just didn't really care when they sharpened it. You can also see there's some nicks and some rolls in there, which means it just was, they just kind of got it sharp and, and moved along, right? Um, I'm not saying serrations are bad, but you'll almost always see serrations on a knife like this. Um, you just will. It's like they just think, well, people who like stuff like this just want to see serrations because they assume that if it's serrated, it's meant for harder use or it's meant for more serious use, right? So you got to use your judgment. That's something you got to kind of judge in combination with other things. Um, usually, obviously, if the if if the handle is both plastic and has some sort of fantasy um, or overly tactical military theme to it, um, it's likely something that's just meant to draw your attention and not serve any other purpose. Oftentimes, again, the name, you know, the biohazard symbol, the Z Hunter, right? It's it's like is is it is it a brand or is it meant to appeal to a certain audience? Um, Little things like that you want to look for. Obviously, you know, take a look at the screws. In this case, I don't think there's any issues with the screws, but oftentimes with really inexpensive, really cheap designs, you'll see uh, screws that have been stripped, like at the factory. Like you, you'll mean you could be looking at a brand new knife, and the heads, the fasteners, will be stripped. Meaning, you know, it's together right now, but you know, if that if that screw works itself out, like how easy is it going to be to get back in, right? Or what if I want to take it apart to clean it because I've been using it? Well, I can't do that because the, the thing is stripped out, right? You got to look for stuff like that. You also want to look, I mean, this is difficult, but you want to look for some sort of stamp that indicates what type of steel that it is. In this case, it actually does say 440 stainless steel. 
And this is a problem because if you don't, you know, know what the, the higher end or the lower end steels are, then it's like, well, that's just a number. How do I know? It's just one of those things where you kind of have to learn about the steels that are associated with higher tiers of knives or, you know, knives that are actually meant to be used. Um, knives that are meant to be used that are manufactured seriously, that are manufactured as tools, you know, or intended as tools, they will not hide anything from you. The design will usually be a little bit more boring. It'll tell you what the steel it, it is, uh, tell you what steel it is. It'll tell you usually, you know, in some way, you know, either on the packaging or on the knife itself, it'll tell you who it was designed by, where it was manufactured, right? It, that information will be there. They will not usually attempt to hide it. Uh, and I, you know, information like that, structural information being hidden is a clear indicator of something that really wasn't meant to be used, or if it was meant to be used, it wasn't meant to be used very long. Uh, under, under no circumstance is this video meant to imply that you have to spend a lot of money to get a better knife. But, uh, I, I would like as many people as possible to know that there is definitely a line between something that really is just meant to be a visually attractive object and a, and a, an inexpensive and efficient cutting tool, right? So again, stuff like this, boring, but good and functional. Stuff like this, a lot more interesting visually, but not functional, bad, uh, a lot of times unsafe, you know. Um, uh, enjoy what you want to enjoy, but you know, if you want to get, um, if you want to get your hands on a good, convenient cutting tool, um, nothing will make that more apparent than actually attempting to cut with something like this, back to back with something like that, or back to back with something like that. It is immediately apparent. This is not a foggy thing. It's not like people pick this up, right? <laughs> and people pick this up and they go, okay, I want you to break down 20 boxes with this and then break down 20 boxes with that. Um, almost every single person, I, I literally cannot disengage this now. I, I actually, this is a perfect example. I actually have to use a screwdriver to disengage that. There, there you go. Case in point, guys, that should not happen. Not a knife that was designed properly. That will not happen with this unless it suffers you know, serious damage on using it. This just, that did that while I was just deploying. That's, that's brand new. You know, um, in, in, a, in a situation like that, after you've broken down the boxes, it will be immediately apparent which one is the better tool. They'll both cut, but man, you're going to be in a lot better you know, shape. Your hand's going to be in a, in a better shape, you know, in better shape. And you're going to be a lot less fatigued after using this, you know, than, than you would be with this. This is just something that will bite into your hand. Uh, the, the blade's not going to pass, you know, through the material efficiently. It's just going to create a huge problem for you. So it might be a situation where you have to kind of roll the dice on a design that appears to be, or, you know, it appears to be what it is that I'm talking about. And then, you know, use it, go out and use it and compare it with, you know, some of the stuff you've previously been using. And, and sometimes that'll be the indicator. And then check for all those little tiny things that I was talking about. Boy, this was a long video. I really hope that this helped somebody. I guess if this video helps one person, I'll consider it a success. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I like to ramble. I like to do discussion topics. I like to do these kinds of things. Um, I, I have uh, lots of reviews on super high end, you know, expensive knives, and I like to delve into the complexities of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I like to entertain people who are veterans of the knife world. And I also like to be super welcoming to people who are brand new to the knife world. But if I can give information that is beneficial to somebody and help them get their hands on something that is an efficient cutting tool and something that, you know, they'll love and enjoy for an extended period of time, you know, and that information can spread from one person to another, then it brings me a lot of joy. So I hope that at the very least you found this video entertaining, uh, hopefully helpful. If you did, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on this metal complex logo right here and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day.